Welcome to Straight Truth with Cameron Mund and Jason Swart. Today, we just want to start off by letting you know who we are and why we are deciding to do these podcasts in the first place. So, who we are, I'll start with, with myself. I'm Cameron Mund, and I'm right now the associate pastor over at Bridge of Faith Church. And I grew up in the St. Louis area in a Christian home and always kind of grew up around that church and Christian environment and always had a passion for learning and always had a passion for God's Word specifically. And so what brought me to the Branson area was College of the Ozarks. I majored in philosophy and religion there and have not lost the passion at all. Just really intrigued by Scripture, I'm intrigued at how God can reveal things to us daily and how it can be our standard for truth. And so that's kind of who I am. Jason, what about you? My name's Jason Swark, and I was saved back in 2000. And when I got saved, I, I decided that I needed a deeper and better relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and I really wanted the fundamentals of understanding who he was. So after I got saved and after I got clean from all the drugs and, and alcohol addiction, I ventured into several different paths. I was a youth pastor for a while, did a lot of time in youth ministry. And from there, I went into Messianic Judaism because I wanted a deeper understanding of who Jesus was as a person. I felt like I knew my wife better than I knew my Savior. So I wanted to have a deeper and more fundamental relationship with my Savior. So I went into Messianic Judaism, spent eight years studying under a rabbi here in Branson. And from there, I ventured out and decided that God was calling me away from that, but wanted me to hold to the things that I had learned and branch out somewhere else. And then I came to Bridge of Faith here in Rockaway Beach. And Cameron and I, just a couple years ago, started teaching together. And we feel like we want to. We wanted to keep doing that. It was. A, it was a really good time that we had over the past couple of years teaching together, and we want to continue to do that. Yeah, and team teaching is something different. Not a lot of people like to share. I don't want to call it a platform, but it is. A, you know, an opportunity to speak God's word and. It's just been neat to learn from you and hopefully teach you and learn from you at the same time. And I know it has been for me. So Jason's coming from a really neat perspective of almost a decade of Messianic Judaism. And for me, more of a straight Protestant line of learning. And So why are we doing these podcasts in the first place? Well, like Jason said, we enjoy team teaching, so we saw this as an opportunity to, to continue to teach together. But ultimately, we're doing this because truth matters. And so today, we just wanted to kind of break it down and let you know what our standard is going to be, what our foundation is going to be for anything we discuss, whether it's a social issue, whether it's a real crazy deep doctrine, you know, that's going to take a couple different podcasts to get through. No matter what it is, we're always going to bring it back to what does Scripture say because Scripture is our source of truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. This morning, you and I talked a little bit, and we were trying to come up with an idea of what to talk about. And you, this week, you have kind of experienced some things through some television shows that you've seen, and that they don't always present accurate scripture interpretation when teaching on television. Why don't you go ahead and share with us a little bit about what you experienced there, and then we can dive right into what we were talking about this morning. You know, I've noticed... And when he says TV station, he doesn't mean ABC or Fox Sports. He means, you know, some of the more religious programming that because of their platform, pretty much anything they say Scripture means, people think that's what Scripture means. And many teachers and non-teachers today do not use the Bible as their standard and their foundation for issues in life. And they don't use Scripture to interpret Scripture. They use other things to interpret Scripture. And so as I was thinking this morning, what are some common things church leaders and church members also tend to use as their foundation other than Scripture? And one of those is tradition. Yeah. They've always believed something. They've always accepted something. And so they continue to believe it. They continue to accept it without second-guessing the fact that, you know, let's see, does this really line up with scripture or is this just line up with my worldview or what I've always grown up believing and you know they don't come by that accidentally I mean that has been a, a historical tradition 
throughout the, the centuries. You can go all the way back to the priesthood of Judaism. You can go all the way back to the monarchy of England and their connection to the Holy Catholic Church. And all of that always comes back to these people are the popular voices of the community. They are more important than we are, so they must know what they're talking about. And we've kind of taken that standard, and we've almost done a, a role change where we've taken these pillars of community, monarchy, and priesthood, and now if somebody's on TV, they seem to know what they're talking about or appear to know what they're talking about. And we've really just changed kind of our idea of what it means for someone to know what they're talking about. You can take that all the way back to the time of Jesus, which we're going to discuss here in a minute, where in Mark chapter 7, Jesus talks about this issue, this very issue, with the people in Jerusalem during the first century. First century Judea was dealing with the same problems as we're dealing with today with our television evangelists and whatnot. Right. And not to say that any Christian on TV is full of garbage, you know, that they can't speak truth because there are certainly some who do. Just to caution, just because they're on TV doesn't mean anything that comes out of their mouth about God's Word is automatically inspired by God or a proper understanding of God's Word. And so this isn't always the case, but many times tradition seems to trump the truth of Scripture. And so our goal is to help return us to the source of truth, which is God's infallible Word. And we're even going to keep each other accountable as we're going through this, that we'll be quoting scholars, we'll be quoting rabbis, we'll be quoting scribes. And even we need to be careful that as we analyze their interpretation of God's holy word, that we don't treat their interpretation as anything higher or more important than God's word itself. Absolutely. So, let's take a look and see what Scripture has to teach us about using God's word as our standard versus not using God's word as our standard. We're going to look at three passages today, and we'll start in Mark 7. And we'll read the first nine verses. Mark 7, 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. And so as Jason just mentioned a moment ago, this same issue was around back then. The idea of treating our traditions, our customs, our religious rituals and practices as being just as authoritative as Scripture is. Now, obviously, if something is taught in Scripture as a sacrament or something is taught in Scripture that we are to do, then we can do that thing with the authority of Scripture in mind. But what Christ is referring to here and what is at what they're talking about isn't something that scripture at all ever dictated or commanded, but it's a commandment and a tradition made up by men. It is. And when we, when we look at this, I mean, you, you can look at from the perspective of even what we do today. Uh, you go into a restaurant, and what do you find on the counter at every restaurant, almost every public place you go to? There's Germex on the counter. And you pump a handful of Germex, and you clean your hands. And, and when you walk out of the bathroom, there's signs on the wall that say, hey, be sure and wash your hands. Jesus... It, and these Pharisees, as they are uh, combating here, the elders have put in place this ceremonial washing of hands. Now, as you walk throughout Scripture, Jesus will point out throughout Scripture that he doesn't like this, uh, this uh, tradition of men that they've created. They're washing their hands, not because Scripture tells them to wash their hands, 
but because generations of scribes and elders and uh, people have been telling them you need to wash your hands, same as we deal with on a daily basis going into restaurants. Wash your hands, you're going to spread germs. But this here is for a religious purpose and not for our sanitary conditions that we do. They had today. been, yeah, and they had been taking this sanitary thing and making it as if God had commanded it. Right. Thus saith the Lord when thus saith not the Lord. <laughs> right. And if you go back to Scripture, in which that's our focus is to take these things back to Scripture, but if these guys had gone back to Scripture, they could have said, you know what, God really doesn't command this, so let's not be so harsh on it. There was a lot of things that they did in this time where in Messianic Judaism, we called it building walls around commandments. They'd build a wall around a commandment so you wouldn't go near touching that commandment. Yeah. And then sometimes they'd even build a fence around that wall. You know, and, right. and this is one of those moments. And then a trench around the fence. Yeah, and then exactly. a moat a around. Moat with crocodiles. <laughs> you end up with a issue of we've gone too far away from what God intended his word to be. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening here. And Jesus is trying to bring these Pharisees back. Yeah. And it's important to understand who these guys were. Uh, the Pharisees were from the school of Hillel. There were two schools in Israel at that time, school of Hillel, school of Shammai. The school of Hillel, uh, we find later in scripture, we find a man named Gamaliel, who was the grandson of Hillel. We also find later in scripture that Paul says he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Now these men were scholars of scripture, most of them Benjaminites uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. They spend day and night studying scripture. Coming at this from the perspective of Judaism, I see the flaws in what they're doing. I see what Jesus is trying to do with these guys and telling them, look, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're taking this to a whole new level. This is a tradition of men, and it's not a tradition of God, which we can look at that, uh, that today, that the religious leaders of today, being those guys that are the centers of attention, the guys with the big, huge churches and have television programs, not saying they're all wrong. You know, sometimes when you listen to what they're saying on television, you kind of you know, you raise your eyebrows and go, whoa, wait a minute, I don't think that's what Scripture says. And we can see here with what with Jesus encountered with the Pharisees that that's exactly what he's doing here is telling them you guys are teaching people incorrectly. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would want to do is to lead a lamb astray. You know, at, here at Bridge of Faith, we have a lot of new believers. I mean, we have people getting saved uh, pretty regularly, uh, more than I've seen in the past 8 to 10 years. I think I'm seeing here in the past year, year and a half, I've seen more salvations here in this building than I have anywhere else that I've been, which is an amazing feat. Uh, I mean, God is moving in, in this congregation, moving through this church. And I would hate to take the pulpit and to lead one of God's little lambs, one of his babies, astray, and to tell them something that was incorrect just because that was what they wanted to hear. Uh, I think it's, it's a great injustice to God and to God's word uh, to lead someone uh, wrong in that in the in the wrong direction just because that's what they want to hear. Jesus didn't deal with the Pharisees in that way, uh, yeah. and we shouldn't be dealing with uh, the lambs of God that way either. Yeah. And if you noticed in the Mark passage, uh, he quotes Isaiah in verses six and seven, and he actually quotes Isaiah chapter twenty-nine, verses thirteen and fourteen. Which says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. And this kind of speaks directly, obviously, if Jesus uses it in Mark, it definitely applies to what he is dealing with, this fact that um, these people are drawing near with their mouths, their lips, but their hearts are not drawing near to God in these situations, to where they've set up all of these extra barriers to try to please God, to try to not fall into that um, sin or whatever they're not trying to, you know, commit. And yet here... Isaiah's prophesying, and he says that the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. And I love how this passage shows us how God's word is 
infinitely more powerful and infinitely more authoritative and important than the wisdom of men and the discernment of men um, to where when Christ's uh, using this passage with the Pharisees and the scribes, he's basically pointing out to them that compared to the word of God, that you're trying to tiptoe around and trying to turn around um, for your own reasons and for your own good, um, you know, your wisdom fails miserably compared to my wisdom and the truth of Scripture. And so it kind of puts into perspective uh, this situation that their fear of him is simply a commandment taught by men, that they've, they've truly missed the heart of uh, God's word. And here in the scripture, it talks about how uh, their wisdom will perish. The wise men and their wisdom will perish. And we so focus on people and their teachings and how we wish, oh, I wish I'd have wrote that down or I wish I'd have done that. But we fail to realize that God is the teacher. Hmm. That wisdom was given by the Holy Spirit that came from God. So that wisdom didn't die with that person. Yeah. The wise man, was, his wisdom died. But that wisdom of the Holy Spirit is still alive and active within ourselves. That doesn't mean that it's gone forever. It just, it's left again to be found. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because God is the never wavering, the never ceasing source of truth right. and wisdom. And so anything that comes from him is from generation to generation. And we can't put so much weight on people in the past. I've been in churches where that pastor... Uh, almost feels like he's in that seat of Moses, you know, and he is the authority. Mm-hmm. And when he passes away, well, the whole church goes with him. Yeah. You know, and that's not right. That's right. not right at all. And I really look at some of these TV guys and see the same, that same mm-hmm. aspect of, of uh, that, uh, I guess you'd call it ego or pride. Yeah. It's kind of the idea of thinking that we are the potter instead of the clay, that this word is, this word that we read that is our foundation, this is what is molding us and shaping us, and it doesn't matter who you are specifically, but what matters is what God's word is, right. and what it can do, do to you and do for your life. Um, exactly. And let's jump over to Psalms, uh, and this is the last passage we'll go over, Psalm 119, verses 97 through 105. <clears throat> oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And if you notice the contrast between David and those who do not use God's word as their source of truth, um, it makes him wiser than those who do not meditate on God's word. Um, He has more understanding than even his teachers. Why? Because... In this setting, what he's referring to is the fact that he is the one that's meditating on God's word. Uh, He understands more than the aged, those who are even older than him. Um, He keeps the precepts of the Lord uh, so that he doesn't do evil. He keeps God's word and he meditates on it. And you just kind of see in that passage of Psalm 119 uh, just the practical benefits of meditating on God's word and the power that it has over a person's life um, to give them understanding and to make them wiser uh, by understanding the Word of God. And you know, when uh, a lot of the times as Christians we hear that word law, and uh, it kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck sometimes because immediately we associate law with legalism. Uh, And to King David, as he's writing, King David isn't just talking about the law is legalism. He's looking at this as God's word. He's looking at the law in the way that the law was uh, originally intended. Uh, And he's seeing not the word that we see is translated as law, but it's Torah. And he's looking at the Torah. And for a king of Israel, 
uh, David loved the Lord. And as a king of Israel, he was one of the first ones, if not the first one, to write his own Torah scroll. And he, wo- he wrote it. Uh, and there is some traditions that even say that he loved the word of God so much that he wore his Torah into combat. That he, you know, he had this passion for Torah. So it's not just, uh, and for those of you who don't know what Torah is, Torah is the first five books of Moses. Uh, and translated in Hebrew, in Greek, it's uh, Pentateuch. Um, and when we look at the Torah, we can't look at it as the legalistic side of things, uh, the legalism. Certainly, it can, it can get there. But when we look at Torah, we, we need to look at it as Genesis, the great stories of Genesis. And when we get into Exodus, the great story of Moses and the Exodus of, of the children of Israel from Egypt. Uh, and Leviticus, how they lined out the priesthood, and uh, in Numbers, the counting of the people, and in Deuteronomy, the last words, the last instructions of Moses before the children of Israel move into the promised land without him. I mean, that is the Torah, and this is what King David's talking about as he's speaking here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we can certainly apply these words of David to our own lives to certainly include the whole of our Bible. You know, all of this word that comes from God that we can meditate on it day and night um, is certainly applicable to us, even though David only had, you know, probably a minimal amount of things that he was um, talking about as far as meditating on. It's pretty exciting to see how David can say this with what he had and then how we can say it also with all the more that God had um, brought to us through the rest of his word. I think we're about out of time. Well, you know, we've been talking about all sorts of different groups of people, all sorts of different ways that um, Scripture can be trumped. Uh, Scripture can be um, equated with traditions of men and sometimes rushed or brushed under the carpet. But uh, ultimately, um, our goal here is to help return us to the source of truth. And that is God's infallible word. And so moving on from this podcast to those in the future, um, our standard is God's word. Our foundation is God's word. So no matter what our topic is, no matter what the discussion is, um, even if we don't agree on everything, God's word is our standard and it is our foundation. Well, in signing off, I am Jason Swark. And I'm Cameron Mund. And this was Straight Truth.